Well, good evening, church. Tonight is September 4th, 2019. 2019 has flown by pretty quick, hasn't it? This church has been experiencing revival and is clearly on the highway headed towards a greater move of the Holy Spirit. I believe in my soul that God has planted this church to feed the nations and that He is watering and growing us to be a unified, mighty oak of righteousness that will plant many more oaks under its shade and beyond. And this is not just LCM. You can listen to the message, Purpose, Vision, Mission, Values, preached last Sunday at the Arising Church and see that God is doing this in all of our churches. I encourage you to go and listen to that message. Here at LCM, we have been on a linear path in our messages. Have you seen it? And we are going somewhere. Everybody say, we're going somewhere. somewhere. The last four or five messages that have been preached in this church have been lining up, and tonight is going to fit right in that line, and it is going right on into Sunday. We've heard White Hot by Pastor Wade and Nick. We've heard Barons of the Earth by Judah Stevens. We've heard Reordered by Keith Phillips. And last Sunday, we heard Rock and the Quarry by all three of our pastors. Can you see how the Lord has been leading us into revival? Man, you could see it. Him encouraging our zeal. Us becoming Barons of the Earth. Being reordered. And becoming anchored to the rock and becoming a quarry. Tonight, our message is entitled, Spiritual Entropy. Spiritual Entropy. You see that, you see that uh, piece of fruit right there? Does it look desirable to you? No. 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 It would be better if it was fresh. Probably was better when it was just fell off the tree, just clean, just got to the grocery store. Fresh fruit always seems to be better, right? And yet God has appointed us to bear fruit that will last. Fruit that will last. I want to start with the scripture from last Sunday's message. Turn with me to Isaiah 51 and verse 1. Say there when you're there. It says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. Tonight, this message is for those who pursue righteousness. For those who want to be righteous, this message is for you. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Man, what a good word. It's my aim tonight to put you on the best possible footing for what you are going to receive in the upcoming services. I want you to listen to me tonight. Because my goal is to prepare you for what you are going to hear in the next couple of messages. I want to tell you the things that are coming up, the messages that are going to be coming soon, are going to be extraordinary. And you need to be listening to me tonight because everything I say is going to be prepping your hearts for what you're going to receive then. Okay? You with me? Tonight, we're going to look backwards. Okay? We're going to look backwards so that we can see how we need to adjust for the future. All right? You follow me? We're going to look backwards. We're going to see what God has done so that we know how to address the future. I want to take a look at a few familiar passages to get a proper understanding of where and how we were cut from the rock. You want to do that? Let's start in Ephesians 2, chapter 1 and verse 4. I'm going to rattle off these. I'm going to stop at different places. I'm going to comment as the Lord, I feel the Lord leads me. Stay with me. Listen to every scripture. Listen to every detail because I promise you we're going somewhere. Ephesians 2, 1, 4. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead in your transgressions and sins. What does it mean to be dead? Is it talking physically? Is it talking spiritually? Is it, what is it talking about? It's talking about you were so spiritually dead in your sins. Your sin was killing you and causing you to be incapable of life. Your sin was killing you. You were like a corpse, dead, couldn't move, 
couldn't respond to God, couldn't have life in you because of your very nature, which was sin. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. We followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That was us. We had a spirit working in us. And it was not the Holy Spirit. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature of we were by nature objects of wrath. Okay? Objects of wrath. We were gratifying, look at that in verse 3, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. That means we were bent on whatever the sinful nature wanted in us. We gratified it. We fed it. We fed into that sinful nature. And following its desires and thoughts. Anyone before Christ was dominated by the desires of the sinful nature and the thoughts of the sinful nature. Isn't that true? Isn't that so true? You were dominated by desires and thoughts of a sinful nature. Isaiah 64 verse 4 says it like this. All of us have become like one who is unclean. Who's all of us? All of us. The entire world. It leaves nobody out. Okay? All of us, all of us have become like one who is unclean. How? How? Because we gratified desires that God hated. We gratified desires that were nasty, filthy, wicked, unclean. You see, when you, when you think unclean, you think maybe of one thing here and there. The truth is, it's not just one thing. It's everything that we followed, everything was unclean. And therefore, we became unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. How could you have righteous acts if you're unclean? You can't. It's what the righteous acts you think you had were like filthy rags in God's sight. Everything that you thought you did that was good, like, oh, I must be a good person because I took time to get out of my car and help an old lady cross the street. Even those things, the word declares that they were like filthy rags in God's sight. Why? It's because not one good work you can do can erase your perpetual gratifying of the sinful nature. There's not one good work you can do to erase that. You can do that one good thing and then go home and commit ten wicked, horrible things. Maybe not just commit, think about them. You could think about those things and dwell on them. Okay? Scripture is putting us in the worst possible light because that's where we were. We were in the worst possible light. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. There is no number to the, to the number of sins that we've committed. There's no number. We can't quantify it in any way. Our sins are so numerous and so great before a holy God that they sweep us away literally into judgment, is what the Word declares. Our sins are mounted upon our shoulders before we are ever atoned for them. They are mounted on our shoulders and we are literally caving under that weight before God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Why does he have to say that? Because our, our propensity is to be deceived. We walk around deceived. We walk around thinking that it's okay if we commit a sin. Everybody does it. But that is being deceived. It's not okay. How many sins did Adam and Eve commit before God kicked them out of His presence? One. One sin. It says, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Who does that leave out, church? Nobody. Nobody. That's all of us. 
That's you. That's me. That's all. That, those are the, that's what we lived in. But read verse 11. And that is what some of you were. That is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What a miracle that God has done. What a miracle that God has done. They say, I heard theologians say that there is more miraculous power in the rebirth of one wicked heart than there was in the entire creation. Because the entire creation, God created something out of nothing. To make you a Christian, God has to take your corrupted, the corrupted, wicked, deviant, depraved heart and turn it into something that is pleasing to Him. Isn't that astounding? And yet God can do it. Yet He desires to do it. That is what some of you were. You were washed. His blood washed the sin. You were sanctified. That means you were set apart as holy to Him. You were, you were sanctioned off to Him. You were consecrated to Him. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means in front of a judge, you were declared righteous before Him. Justified means standing in a just position before a judge. That is what He did for you, church. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But because of His great love for us. Everybody say great love. great love. God who is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. Made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions. So not only did He wash you. Not only did He sanctify you. Not only did He justify you. He made you alive. When you're born again, you're al you become alive. You, take, you finally take steps for the first time in your life. Righteous steps. You become alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. In the heavenly realms, church. Not only are you here walking on the earth, but your position is seated with Christ where He's at. That means there's no disparity between Christ and you in God's eyes when you were born again. Think about that. The work that he did was so perfect that God sees no distinction between Jesus and you. That's glorious, church. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We're going to keep going. Therefore, if, it, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us to Himself. You who were once far away have been brought near to Christ. Isaiah declares that He is a high and lofty one who dwells in a high and lofty place. There's nothing you can do, no ladder you can build to attain and come up to God's level. And yet, through His blood, He has brought you to Himself. He's brought you close. You have been made into a new creation. Man, don't you remember that? Folks, folks uh, here tonight who have actually been born again, don't you remember when you were born again and you were made into a new creation? Man, I remember it. I remember it with everything in me. I remember the first night... I cried out to God, and I went and looked in the mirror, and what I saw in the mirror was a brand new person. I looked, and the old had completely gone. The purposeless, angry, hateful person had left, and I had a Christ inside me with a new relationship with Him. He brought me near. He reconciled me to Himself. What does that mean? He, he reconciles you to Himself for the purpose of a relationship with Him. So no, you can't have all of these other things, you're washed, cleansed, sanctified, justified, without actually having a relationship with Him. The sole purpose of God reconciling you to Himself is so that you're close, so that you can have fellowship, so that you can talk with one another and walk with one another, and you could share things together with God. 
That is the purpose of being reconciled to Him. Ephesians 2.12 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. You who were far away were brought near to Him. It's like an enemy reconciled. It's like people who are not on speaking terms making peace. You were not on speaking terms with God. You were enemies with God. He was enemies with you. But peace was made through Jesus Christ. And now you can be brought close to Him for the sole purpose of having a relationship with Him. Think about that, church. You began a a relationship with God, and that relationship brought results, okay? Relationship with God brings results. Say that with me. Relationship brings results. Immediately, like 2 Corinthians 5.17, when you are born into God, there are certain results that happen, okay? Theologians have tried to name it whatever they want to name it, whether they call it sanctification, whether they call it the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the born-again stage, whatever they call it, it is true, absolutely true, that a genuine salvation is marked with results, okay? I'm going to give you right now seven results of a relationship with God. Seven results that is a relationship that is, that is a result of relationship with God that is at work inside of every person who is born of God. Do you want to know those seven things? May I tell you, this is going to light your soul on fire. We are going to take a look into the book of 1 John, okay? We're going to examine a, a couple passages in the book of 1 John. And so before we do, I'm going to share, everybody turn to 1 John 5, chapter 5, verse 13. Say there when you're there. First John chapter 5, verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Amen. Why is John writing this letter? So that the recipients can know that they have eternal life. Don't you think that's a pretty important question? Don't you think that's a, an, a pretty important thing to know? Why, why does he have to write that? He probably has to write that because there are so many people that think they have eternal life. You go ask everybody that you know, hey, do you have eternal life? 99% are going to say yes. 99% of people who call themselves Christians are going to say yes because who wants to say no? Who have you ever heard honestly say, actually... I'm a little bit terrified that I might not be right with God. Usually doesn't happen, does it? Usually we like to think the best of ourselves. Usually we like to think that God sees us and grades us on a curve. Okay? We love to do that about ourselves, but when we look at other people, we don't give them that same curve, do we? That is the wicked, prideful nature that is inside all of us. Our sin is not offensive, but your sin is. My sin's not offensive, but your sin is, really. John is writing so that you know you have eternal life. You ready to hear seven results of a relationship? The first one, we've got a slide made for you. The first result of a relationship with God that is planted in you when you're born again is walking in darkness versus light. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim, listen, claim, if we claim to have fellowship with God, with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Why does he have to say that? Because people are claiming. Like, oh yeah, I walk in the light. Well, examine yourself. Let's see how, let's see if this is true. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Walking in the light versus the darkness. Okay? When you are born again, God puts a desire inside of you to walk in the light. 
When you're born again, nobody ought to tell you, hey, brother, you need to walk in the light. Okay? It's something that God plants in your heart. To walk pure before Him. To walk right before Him. To not hide anything or be doing deeds in the darkness that you keep repeating, that you keep doing, sins that you keep habitually doing to feed your sinful nature while you're saying you're in the light. That's not being in the light. It is in the nature of every person born of God to want, listen to what I said, church, to want to walk in the light. To want to walk in the light. And this is not so much talking about committing a sin. It's not. 1 John 2, if you go down just a little bit, 1 John 2, 1 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Of course, he's writing to you so that you won't sin. Jesus doesn't want you to sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Look, church, this is not talking about committing a sin, repenting, confessing, and then getting cleansed of that sin. No, this is talking about a desire to walk in the light, to walk in the light, to not walk in darkness. That is one result of a relationship with God. The second result is a hunger for obedience. In 1 John 2, verse 3 through 4, it says, We know we have come to know Him, if we obey his commands, we can know for sure that we have come to know Jesus Christ and we're not faking it if we obey him. First John two five says, but if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. We know we are in Christ because we are obedient and we have a hunger for more obedience. Man, I want to tell you, the result of a relationship with God is that you want to be more obedient. You want to be more obedient. Man, if you, if you get one glimpse of Jesus, if you get one glimpse tonight of Jesus, if you could see Him for a second, you'll want to drop everything else in your life and give Him all. Because He is the most glorious, He is the most beautiful, He is the most awesome thing ever offered on men's behalf. That you can't help but want to be obedient. That is inside of every person who is born of God. The third one, love for brothers and sisters. And I want to tell you, church, this is the one I struggle with the most. 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. And there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. It says also in 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. It's plain and simple. You see, when God does this miracle in your heart called being born again or transformed or whatever you want to call it, you have a supernatural love for the people of God that is birthed inside your heart. I remember when I got born again, before that, I did not like Christians at all. I didn't like the way they dressed, didn't like the way they talked, didn't like anything that they did. And I felt like they didn't like anything I did. So I was totally comfortable with avoiding them. I knew that God was doing a work in me because the impossible had happened. I had a supernatural love for the people of God. And I know you've experienced that too. When God is doing a work in your life, you can't help it but to love. Despite the differences, despite the aggravations, despite the the tiny little things that kind of rub up on you, iron sharpening iron, you have a deep supernatural love for the people of God. Despite what differences you have, despite how eccentric they are, despite all of the things, there ought to be a deep supernatural love. Love residing in your hearts for the people of God. I want to tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, if it wasn't for Jesus, I don't think any of us would be here. I don't think any of us would be here because, but because Christ's love has been poured out into our hearts, we have that for one another. Supernaturally, Holy Spirit filled love. That is a result of a relationship with God. 
The fourth one, is this the fourth one? The fourth one is doing what is right comes naturally. 1 John 3, 8 through 10. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. He can't go on sinning. Whoop. Back up. Number four. Doing what is right. 1 John 3, 8 through 10. Oh, overcoming the world. I skipped one. We'll revisit that one because it's going to be important. Amen. Overcoming the world. Hallelujah. Overcoming the world is number four. Give it up for number four. Yeah. Come on, number four. Number four is overcoming the world. In 1 John two fifteen through 17, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that is in the world, the cravings of sinful men... The lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. It de- the Word declares that if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Man, when you were born again, did, didn't you seem to just kind of separate from those things? Did anybody have to tell you, really? No, you had it in you. You knew that you needed to get away because you knew that it was not of God. I want to challenge you tonight. Is there a desire in you to please a group or a certain group of people in the world? Because if there's a desire in you to be pleasing in the eyes of man to a certain group in the world, probably the love of God is not in you. You see, what happens as a result of a relationship with God is that you separate from the world. Let's go on to number five. Number five is doing what is right. Looks like we got that mixed up. So I will, I will do... Number five, and skip on my notes. Number five is harmony in the spirit. 1 John 4, 5 through 6. It says, they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. You hear that, church? Whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So what it's it's not saying is that everything that I say, you have to listen and agree to. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that ultimately when it comes down to disagreements or anything like that, ultimately we're going to end in unity. Ultimately, we're going to end in a place where we have unity together. You'll never find Pastor Wade and I arguing about something and then splitting. You'll never find Pastor Matt. You'll never find any of you guys arguing about something that causes us to split permanently. You'll never find that. Because unity in the Spirit is a result of a relationship with God. We will always end in Even if we choose to disagree we will always end in harmony, which results in love for one another and respect for one another. So, number six is doing what it's right. Doing what is right. 1 John 3, 8 through 10 says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. It's impossible to go on sinning. What does that mean? I'll explain This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Okay, what does it mean we can't continue in sin? When in 1 John chapter 1, towards the end of the chapter, it says if we claim we have no sin, we make him out to be a liar. What does it mean we can't continue in sin? It means you cannot continue growing, progressing, in sin. The pattern of a born again person's life is a life that is crushing sin, that is reducing sin in your life, that is rooting it out and ridding it, getting rid of it. A result of a relationship with God is that you do what is right. And I want to say, you could tell when somebody wants to do what is right. Even if you don't know what's right in a certain situation, isn't it in the heart of someone who loves the Lord, to go, wait, I don't know quite clearly what the right thing to do is here, but I'm going to pray and I'm going to find out what the right thing is because I want to do the right thing. You see, that doesn't happen to the world. That doesn't happen to the wicked. But those of us who have a relationship with God, it's one of the results. 
The last one is life in the sun. This is my favorite. Life in the sun. 1 John 5.10 says, Anyone, who? Anyone. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about him. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Okay? Those who are born again, those who are made new creations, receive life in the Son. You receive a testimony in your heart about the Son of God. Before I was born again, I heard about the Son of God everywhere. I heard from the Pentecostals, the Baptists, the Catholics, the Methodists, the Lutherans. I heard the Muslims talk about Jesus and the Son of God that they don't believe in. I had no idea what it meant. But the moment I got right with God and entered into a relationship with Him, that testimony was birthed in my heart. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. And He's giving me life. You see, the testimony of the Son of God is not just that you know it. The testimony of the Son of God is, is He in your heart? And is He giving you life? Is He giving you life? Do you feel His life growing in you? That is a result of a relationship with God. These are the results, the seven results of a relationship with the Father. We cannot, listen to me church, we cannot, should not, shall not try to convince anyone that they need to walk in these things. Are you hearing me? If you find yourself trying to convince someone that they need to walk in these things, they're probably not born again. They're probably not born again. Because these are results of a relationship with God. If someone has to be convinced that they need to walk in these things, they are not born again. And do not know God. If you have ever experienced these things occurring in, the, in your heart, if you, if you have not experienced these results, and I want to take plain assessment, if you have not experienced all seven of those, then this is where you stop in the message. This is where you need to stop whatever you got to do. Stop, pray, do whatever you have to do until you see those supernaturally occurring in your life. Okay? Because again, these are results of a relationship with God. Okay? Now, again, think back to that time when you were cut when you were first cut from the rock, did you see these things at work in you supernaturally? Do you remember? Do you remember those moments where these things just happened? Nobody had to convince you. Nobody had to tell you it was important to read the Bible. Nobody had to tell you it was important to pray. You just did it. Because you had a relationship. Now, you might not have the capacity and consistency that you want, but that is what the Holy Spirit and discipleship are for. What I'm talking about are all the seeds of these things in your heart. And if they are, we're going to grow them tonight. Amen. This is what discipleship accomplishes. It grows these things. Does this list serve as a reminder of what God done is, has done in your life? Are you remembering some of the things that when you overcame anger, when you overcame laziness, when you overcame whatever it was, do you remember some of those things in your life? Do you remember the times that you had these results of relationship in greater measure than you do tonight? Can you think back to a time in your life where you had these things and they were greater, more magnified in your life than tonight? Any of those seven? Can you think, any of those seven, were they greater showing themselves more in my life at a past period than they are tonight? If you were like me, then there are some areas that God has touched your soul and watered with His Holy Spirit that you have let die, that you haven't seen in a while. The Bible calls us to remember the things done in the past. Okay? Sixty times in the Word of God, 
It calls us to remember things that were done in the past. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember what I did for you. Remember these things. Remember, remember, remember. Why is it calling us to remember? I picked out one scripture just for, just for you that calls us to remember. It's Revelation 3, chapter 2. Or Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. So in Revelation, it's calling to an entire church. Remember, remember therefore what you have received and heard. Remember. This is because as people, we forget the things God has received to us. We forget. We forget the things God has done. It's because we're always looking for something new. We're always looking for something new. Always something new. We tend to think that when we need something new, we tend to think that we need something new in order to grow. When we really just need to remember and live up to what we have already attained, church. Live up to what we have already attained. We don't need to run off to some new teaching, some new this, some new way of explaining things, some new whatever. We need to live up to what God has revealed in our hearts already. We have to remember these things because spiritual entropy has its effect. I'm going to put a definition on the, on the screen for you. We, we looked up Google, the definition of entropy, it's a scientific term or a physics term. Lord, I don't know. But it's a pretty, pretty interesting concept. Entropy is the degradation of the matter and energy in the universe to an ultimate state of inert uniformity. It's a process of degradation or running down or a trend to disorder. A trend to disorder. Okay? Physicists, scientists, they use this word to, descri- to, to describe the trend to disorder that everything in the universe is on. Everything in the universe has a trend to it, and that trend is not to become more perfected. That trend is to become more disorderly. It's called degradation. It's called decay. It's called ruin. I, just to, you know, the degradation of matter and universe, if that didn't do it for you, I looked at Merriam-Webster's. Uh, actually, that is Merriam, Merriam-Webster's. Then maybe uh, Google will help with this. The second definition in Google says, a lack of order or predictability, a gradual decline into disorder. This refers to the rate of decay that exists in the universe. Come on, Paul. Paul and I were talking about this uh, the other night. The rate of decay that exists in the universe. Think. The trend to disorder. You can place hot water in a jar and leave it, and you can place cold water in a jar and leave it, and both will end up lukewarm. How, how is that? It's because both extremes are constantly trying to find a middle ground, a balancing. They're always trying to degrade into a middle safe ground. Not too extreme in one direction. Okay? Think of the half-life of things. Everything's in a constant state of decay. Doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to help it decay. It's natural. Okay? Think of trees, rocks, metals, all in a state of decay. You create a brand new piece of beautiful iron and leave it out somewhere and it starts to degrade. It's because entropy is taking its effect. What about roofs, Brother Tom? What does a roof do? Degrades. It decays. Everything is naturally bent to a state of decay. It is the same with us, church. The result of relationship with the Father will degrade Unless we do something about it. Unless we do something about it. Our relationship with God will decay if we don't do something about it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8 verse 4. We're going to dig in a little bit. Am I preaching to anybody tonight? Preaching to myself. This entire word came from me in prayer 
asking the Lord, please do not let these things that you did in me die out. Please don't let them die. You did such an incredible work in the beginning, but I haven't been faithful to stop the rate of decay. I've let things come in. I've let thoughts, whatever. Good Lord, it's been years since I was born again. Decay has settled. Luke chapter 8, verse 4, you there? While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. It was trampled on. And the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on, on rock. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. Skip on down to verse 11, and we're going to see the interpretation by King Jesus. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. So we have four different scenarios where seed is falling. We're seeing how they, how they grow. And you know, honestly, it's not the first two scenarios that scare me. Okay? It's not the first two that scare me, really. Because the first one lands, first one lands along the path, bam, instantly snatched by birds. Doesn't even really take root, doesn't even really grow. <laughs> when I think about this, I think, that, that must not be me. You know, I, I've grown a little, I think. Verse 13, those on the rock were the ones who received the word with joy, but they have no root. Well, certainly I've got a little bit of root. I mean, I've grown a little, right, Lord? The one that scares me is the one that grew up, grew up a little, but it grew up amongst thorns. And the thorns have choked the plant. The thorns have choked it out. Okay? Are you hearing me, church? It grew, this is one that actually grew up. It's not one that was just snatched away in the beginning. We've seen a million of those, right? This is one that actually grew up a little bit. And it was choked out. How long did it take to be choked out? We don't know. We just know that it was choked out. We don't know if it took six months, a year, five years, ten years. We don't know. We just know that it was choked out. That's what scares me. Is that there are agents of entropy trying to choke out our faith. I want to share with you three, oh, sorry, not three, 13 agents of entropy that I found in my own life. All right? Comparison. Man, has your walk reduced to just how you compare yourself with other people in the body? Has, has your entire walk summed up with, well, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like that one over there. Remind you of anybody? Comparison will choke you out and cause decay. How about FOMO? Anybody know what that is? The fear of missing out. Man, does the fear of missing out cause you to be a little bit uh, anxious? You're constantly wondering, oh man, who's going, who's going here? Who's going, who's going over there? Man, where are you going where, where to be? Hey, who's going with you? I want to know. I don't want to miss out. Hey, I'm, oh man, Pastor Wade's over there talking to somebody. I'm going to go sit right there because I don't want to miss anything. The fear of missing out. You know what that really is? A lack of maturity and security in your relationship with Christ. The third one, experience. I put in parentheses arrogance or assumptions. Experience. Man, you think you've experienced something in the kingdom? You think, you think that you have, have attained a level of experience? And it causes you to know what's going to happen every time. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I've seen that. I'm not even going to try. Oh, I know what happens when that brother goes to that place. I'm not even going to warn him. 
Oh, I know what happens when this person preaches. That, ex- that experience that you have, relying on that, will cause decay to your relationship with God. How about advance- advancement? Your, your walk becomes just a way for you to advance on the ladder. And then you begin asking God questions. Lord, what, why, haven't, why haven't I been attained to this level? Why don't I get to do this? Why don't, surely I have matured enough, Lord, for you to hand me this, for you to, to grant me with the responsibility of this. Advancement. How about familiarity? Have you become a little bit too familiar with the things of God? A little bit too familiar with with. The, the incredible miracle that happens here every Wednesday. The fact that we get to worship together in God's presence. Does that become a little bit too familiar? Like, yeah, I don't want to go. You know, we're just going to do the same thing we always done. Nothing's going to change. Worship's going to go like this. There's going to be a few prophecies and people are going to come and repent. You let that enter into your thoughts and that will choke out the seed that God planted in you. How about dissatisfaction? Dissatisfaction. Nothing is satisfying you. Nothing. You're not content with where God has you. As a matter of fact, the things that God has done for you, you don't even remember them. All you're wanting is more and more, Lord, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you brought me here? Why Why am I not over there ministering like you called me to? Dissatisfaction causing you to be discontent with everything God is doing and blind to what He's trying to speak to you now because you're not satisfied with what He's saying now. How about busyness, church? Busyness. Come on, this is LCM. You get yourself in the truck and you get to work. And yet, you can allow busyness, just the, the, the rote task of doing things, cause you cause you to just kind of focus in on tasks. Focusing in on tasks. You let busyness become your life or is your life first and foremost about your relationship with the king and producing fruit from that on? Failure. Anybody ever failed and just didn't want to try again? Man, I'm going to tell you, failure can be a thorn growing up Failure can cause you to distance yourself between you and Jesus because you feel like he'd never accept you after what you've done. Failure can be a thorn in your life. Failure can cause you to feel like there's no hope for you. We have to kill that thorn. Skill. You think you've got some skills in the kingdom? You're relying on your skills? You're proud of your skills? Like, man, I could do this. I could do that. Man, I'm way better at this than he is. She is, whatever. Skill, your own skill can accredit your pride with something that drags you further and further away from your relationship with God. About apathy. Anybody ever struggle with apathy? I'm not talking about laziness either. Laziness is totally different from apathy. Apathy is losing the will to care. Losing the will to care. It's like, yeah, I just, I'm not really concerned with that anymore. Painter calling me. I'm going to be a little bit apathetic towards that right now. Number 11 on my list is skepticism. Skepticism. Being a skeptic, constantly thinking the worst about people, will cause you to be choked out. Uselessness. Feeling like, well, Lord's not using me, so I might not be worth anything to him anymore. Man, Lord's not using me like he's using that brother over there. Again, comparison. Man, the Lord's not using me like he's using Pastor Wade. I must not be any, I must have lost my value in the kingdom. Therefore, I'm not going to try. Being comfortable, number 13. And I'm not talking about sitting on a cushy couch. Not talking about uh, being at a desk with your feet propped up, drinking spiritual Mai Tais. (laughs) Pastor Johnson says, I'm talking about being comfortable with letting things drift between you and Jesus. I'm talking about going a day without prayer. You're like, <laughs> you know, Monday was really good with the Lord. I can kind of skip Tuesday. 
And then that turns into Wednesday. And that turns into Thursday. And before you know it, you are totally comfortable with not seeking God's face. You are totally comfortable with not pursuing His presence. You are totally comfortable, like Samson, He has left you and you don't know it. Being comfortable. Comfortable with your state. Church, the truth is, is that whether you have been born again one month, six months, one year, five years, ten years, twenty years, right now you are, you are at the furthest point from the moment you first fell in love with Jesus. Right now, everyone is at the furthest point. Everyone will experience these thorns trying to choke the life out of you. All of you will. The hardest thing is that it can be difficult to detect it happening because it happens slowly. That is why we need the Word of God to remind us of our high position in Christ Jesus. We need the Word of God to refresh us and interject God's Holy Spirit into us. Let's pray right now. Pray with me, church, that the Word of God is going to stir us up tonight. Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you would refresh. Lord, that you would re revamp our souls. Lord, that our hearts would fall madly in love with you all over again. Lord, that we would have the same love that we had at first. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to begin to ramp up the speed. Okay? 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Says, I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness, but you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led, be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you have received a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you, you have accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Okay? Imagine, so this is Paul the Apostle. We could read this and we don't really get the, the feeling of the first time. We don't get the feeling of the original audience when we're listening to this. It's like, yeah, it was written 2,000 years ago by a man who was dead, who is dead, to a church who is all dead. Okay? Imagine now that you're sitting with your favorite pastor. You know, my favorite pastor is Pastor Wade and Pastor Matt. <laughs> I can't pick one without the other. It would break my heart if I was sitting with Pastor Matt and Pastor Matt looked at me and said, look, I'm jealous for you, Justin, with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may be somehow led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Imagine you having a one-on-one -on -one with one of your pastors or your elders and they're looking at you and they're saying that it's like I am concerned that you're being deceived just like Eve was how was Eve deceived a crafty snake came and told her something that you know, he twisted God's word and the concern here is that we can have the same kind of deceit going on in us you could be deceived the same way that Eve was her devotion to God was so simple it was so simple in the garden, it couldn't get any harder than that, could it? Literally, you can eat of anything, just not that one tree. And Satan was able to deceive her. How easily do you think Satan is able to deceive you from pure and simple devotion? It's not that hard, church, really, when you think about it. You fall in love with Jesus and you just do what he says. And yet, how easy is it to be deceived these 13 thorns come into our life and it chokes us and deceives us and our minds all twisted up and we've forgotten the result of our relationship with Christ. We've forgotten what God did in us in the beginning. And we're all wrapped up. We're entangled in entropy, spiritual entropy. Pure and sincere devotion to Christ. I want to say that he goes on to say, I'm concerned that you're following a different Jesus than the one we preach to you. Everyone in here could think, oh, no, I'm not following a different Jesus. There's only one Jesus. Not true. 
you could easily be deceived into following a Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? I'm talking about the self-enrichment Jesus. You know, the one that says, you know, bless me, Lord. Come on, when are you going to... When are you going to give me a pedestal to stand on, Lord? How about the all-accepting Jesus? The one that always accepts your performance. No. Hey, God, you see me. You know my heart. I failed, but you still accept me. Your word says it. How about the distant Jesus? He doesn't see or care about your motives or attitudes as long as you complete the final goal. As long as at the very end you just complete what he told you, doesn't matter how you did it, doesn't matter your attitude or motives in the middle. How about the track record Jesus? He advances you based on your skill level. Like, oh, I just got to grow my skill levels. If I could just get the perfect score in Acts, Acts 1 on my preaching review, <laughs> Jesus is really going to think something of me. And yet we deceive ourselves all the time into believing in that Jesus. How about the patient Jesus? Oh, he's got all the time in the world. He told me to do something, but Jesus will just wait because he knows I'm the man for the job. You're laughing, but how many of you have had these thoughts? You're believing in a different Jesus. How about the gentle Jesus? He looks at everything with love and kindness. How about the idle Jesus? Put him wherever you want. You can put him, you know, somewhere at the end of the week, somewhere in the middle of the week but he's not everything to you. It's just something you placed somewhere. Okay? The pure and sincere devotion is what we're after tonight. Do you want it? Yeah. Yeah. Titus 1, 15, verse 16. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. To the pure, all things are pure. This is not just about sexual in, innuendos, church. Anytime we hear that, we immediately go, somebody's making a joke, I took it the, somebody took it the other way, and we say, oh, brother, to the pure, all things are pure. That's not the context of this verse. The context of this verse is explaining how elders should conduct themselves in the kingdom of God versus false elders who are going and sharing lies around in houses and things. Paul's writing to Titus and saying, look, to the pure, all things are pure. And by the way, we have the best elders in this church. We have elders who do... If there's anything our elders do that is not pure, it has escaped me. I want to be honest. It seems like they are never full of selfish ambition. They are never full of greed. They are never full of anything other than Christ. The context of Titus is how to be an elder. And he's saying to the pure, all things are pure. Listen again, church. To the pure, all things are pure. Nothing you do, if you're pure, will be mixed. Do you remember when you didn't know anything? You didn't know anything about the Bible. You didn't know anything about theology. You didn't know anything. And yet, you walked in the purity of Christ. Do you remember that, church? When you were first born again, did you know what you know now? And does it seem sometimes that we had a purity then that we kind of struggle to maintain now? Remember when you were weak, but you felt close to Him? In fact, our weaknesses cause us to rely on Him more. What a blessing. What a delight to lean on Jesus and not our own flesh. You see, we want to be presented as strong to our brothers. All of us. I know I, I deal with that too. I want to be presented in front of you as someone who is strong. And yet, do you remember when you were first born again, you were weak, and yet you were leaning on Christ. Come on, what a blessing. What a blessing to be weak. That's how Paul can say, I delight in my weaknesses. Because it causes him to lean further. You know, church, there's a reason why you can't do everything that you want to do right now in your own strength. Because if you could, why would you need Christ? There's a reason he's put limits on you. There's a reason that you need fellowship. There's a reason why you need to be together. It's because we're weak. And it's a gift that God has given us, those weaknesses. I want to ask you tonight, what do you find yourself boasting in? If any of you... If any of you could have five minutes and come and brag on this stage, what would you brag about? Would you brag about what you 
you, you witnessed to somebody and you told them this scripture and they said this and you blocked it with this scripture, what would you talk about, church? If you could get up here and boast, what would you boast about tonight? Would you boast in how great a mighty man you are and what great things you do? Or would you get up here and boast about what Jesus has done? What Jesus has accomplished and how that is resulting in your life? I remember when I was born again, I said, I know that this is real because I'm not making it up. It's just happening. Okay? I'm afraid it's all too easy to attain a standing in the eyes of our peers and yet be missing this purity. Yet be missing this pure and simple devotion to Christ. I'm afraid it's very easy. I know. I, I'm preaching to you exactly what I'm experiencing. Okay? It is so easy to project, I'm strong, I'm doing good, I had a great day, I, I'm good. And yet, spiritual entropy is eroding your relationship with your Father. Eroding the purity that you had when you walked with Him. Philippians 2.12, Paul's asking, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. True true results exist at all times, not just in front of people. If God is truly working in you, it's working in you alone when nobody's watching, and it's working on you in front of everyone. Okay? Not only in the presence of us, but in our absence. It continues in us because we continue to work it out. Colossians 1.21, verse 23. We're about an hour in. I tried to keep this under an hour, but I, I'm just preaching tonight, church. I'm just... I want to share with you what God's doing in my heart. Colossians 1.21. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Amen. Without blemish and free from accusation. Amen. If you continue in your faith, if you continue in your faith, not moved from the hope held out from the gospel. I'm going to ask it again tonight. Were the results of your relationship with God that you once had that were burning so bright, and now they've faded. Now they've seemed to dissipate, and they've eroded. It says, He will present us without blemish if we continue in our faith. Not if we back away from it, fade away from it, let it die out. You could hear Jesus saying, When I come, will I find faith on the earth? Because the trial that is coming, the love of many will grow cold. Will he find faith? Will we continue in our faith? 1 John 2, 28. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Any of you want Jesus to come back tonight? You don't have to answer that. But think about it. How many of us came to church going, I hope he returns tonight. I'm ready. If he comes, I'll be unashamed at his appearing because I've been continuing in him. 1 John 2, 24 tells us how to continue in him. It says, see that, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and the Father. What did you hear in the beginning? What did you hear and what were the results of you hearing it? What did you hear? What seed was planted in you at the beginning? And has that seed remained in you to the same strength and even greater? What seed is that? Think about it. For me, what I heard in the beginning is that I'm a horrible sinner And yet God sent His Son to die and pay for my sins. The result of that was a relationship with God that produced those seven results. That's what I heard from the beginning. And I have to be honest with you. If I take assessment with my life, pretty darn 
difficult to say that I have continued in what I heard in the beginning, that I have not allowed some of those things to experience entropy. Can you remember how to say it? Think with me. What did you hear in the beginning and what were the results? Acts 14, 21. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true in the faith. (laughs) What were they encouraging them? To remain true in the faith. Why did they have to say that? Because there's a propensity to not remain true. To just fly along with it. Just kind of make it up as we go. Remain true in the faith. Don't let entropy ruin your results. We have to remain true, authentic, and pure. We're going to start making a turn now as we work towards our closing. Our clothing. Closing. We need to grasp what we've originally heard to experience those results again. As you've been listening, you're probably now saying, I need to experience those results again. So we're going to go back to what you've originally heard, and we're going to, we're going to launch right back in it. Do you want to go back to where you were? Then go with me. Turn with me to Ephesians 3, verse 16. We're going to grasp what we've originally heard In the beginning. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Son and your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of, of, of Christ, of God. Church, tonight we want to grasp the love of God. We want to grasp the love that surpasses knowledge. Okay? This is not a love that you can know about. This is a love that you experience from God. This is a love that you come into His presence and you feel His love moving on you and you react to it. There's a result to that love relationship. Tonight we're going to pray, let us grasp how wide that love is for us. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. God commands... That we love Him. Okay? It's pretty simple to get from this verse, isn't it? Pretty pashat. God requires us to love Him. It's one way of saying it. God demands us to love Him. It's another way of saying it. He's probably saying it because He wants you to love Him. He has a desire for you to love Him. He has a desire for your affection. He has a desire for your, for you. He has a desire to hear you calling out to Him. He has a desire to hear you talking with Him. He wants you to love Him. Man, what kind of love is that? Who could deny a love like that? Who could deny a love like that, church? When someone, when, when all somebody wants is for you to love them, when someone wants you that much, doesn't it kind of, cause you to take a step back a little bit and go, why? Why do you want me to? Because He just wants you. He wants your love. He has a longing for you to long for Him. He wants those times with you when you're alone worshiping and all you can think about is, oh, how great is He? Oh, what He's done for me. Oh, those things, how glorious He is. And you're starting to to worship Him. That's what He wants. He wants your actions that are led by love. He wants to see you stretch out because you love Him more than anything else. He wants that from you, church. And yes, He's worthy of it. And He desires it. Come on, we don't think about that enough, church. We think, Ephesians 2 says that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Okay, But that's not all we were created for. 
That is not all we were created for. You know how many scriptures in the word where God says, if I needed something, I wouldn't ask you. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. But where is the house that you're going to build for me? If I needed something, what will you do? He says in Job when he's answering him. You think that if, if God wanted something done, he couldn't do it better himself than using miserable, weak people like us? There's no such thing as a great man of God. There are pitiful, broken, desperate, in love men who are in the hands of a great God. Okay? He's not just longing for your servitude. He's not looking for slaves. He's looking for sons. He's looking for, for relationship. Church. Second Thessalonians talks all about He loved us and gave us His grace. God never sent the angels a Savior, but He did for us. Because He loved us and He sent us His grace. 1 John 4.10 says this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son for us. He loved us first, church. He loved every single person in this room. He longed for it enough to sacrifice for you. He proved it by His actions. John 15 9 through 10, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. As the Father loved Jesus, so Jesus has loved you. What kind of love? It's easy to think that the Father loved Jesus. He was perfect. Okay, who wouldn't love Jesus? He was perfect. And it says that same love that the Father had for Jesus, Jesus had for you, church. That same love. Galatians 2.20 talks all about how Christ, how, how Paul is now crucified with Christ. That he no longer lives. But not him, but Christ living in him. Who loved him and gave himself up for Paul. Now that love was so infectious that it caused Paul to give up everything that he had. Because he was, <laughs> he was madly in love with the one who loved him. Church, do you have that kind of love in your hearts right now for the one who loves you? Because I want to tell you, he loves you far more than what we, what we usually show him. Far, far more. I searched the word far and wide to try to find scriptures that relate to how God feels about you. And you want to know how hard that was? It's a little bit difficult. You'll find uh, 500 to 1 scriptures that say what God has done for you versus scriptures that... Explain how God feels about you. And I found a couple. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Even in his discipline, he loves you. And he does it because he loves you. And he does it to the son he what, church? Delights in delights. God delights in you. What does it mean for the king of kings to delight? He finds pleasure. It brings him joy. It makes him happy. His sons. Psalm 147 verse 7. Turn with me to Psalm 147 verse 7. You're going to want to hear this. I promise you this is coming to a close very soon. We're going to get a chance to reignite that first love tonight. Amen. To go back to what God originally spoke to us and have those results of our relationship burning brightly. Psalm 147 verse 7 says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain. He makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor is his delight in the legs or the strength of man. The Lord delights in those who fear him and who put their hope in his unfailing love. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He's like, he's writing about all the things that God does. And he's like, well, he does this, he does that, he does a little of this, and he kind of dabbles in that. But he doesn't take any pleasure in those things. What he delights in is you. 
What he delights in is you when your heart is open fresh and you're responding to a holy God and you are craving his presence as much as he is craving your presence. Okay? Always remember that he sent his one and only son to shed his blood for you. He desires you. He delights in you. Psalm 103, verse 8, is one of my personal favorites. It says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west... As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting... The Lord's love is with those who fear Him and His righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. He remembers that our days, He remembers that we are are simply dust. He remembers that we are like grass that fades away. And yet, He shows us compassion. He loves us like a father loves a son. One of the greatest joys about having kids is looking right at your kid in the face and seeing your reflection in their face and seeing the joy on their face to look at you the way that you're looking at them. That is one of the most beautiful times as a parent. Do you not think that God feels the same about you? Have you simply just thought, Come, you come to give lip service. You come to show up, put in your time card. You're going to do all these righteous acts, and yet you, those righteous acts really aren't being birthed from the right place, the result of your relationship. Church, God desires to look at you in the face and see his reflection. He desires to see you look at him the same way he looks at you. We have the worship team come up. We get ready to close. John 14, 20 through 24. Start in verse 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Jesus is making it very clear. If you obey his commands, you're showing your love for him. That's how you do that. That's how you show your love for him is that you obey what he says. But look at verse 23. Are you guys with me tonight? Everybody checking out verse 23? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. You see a difference there between what we just said? Anybody catch it? In verse 21, whoever has my commands and obeys him, he is the one who loves me. Right here it says, anyone who loves me will obey my my teaching. What comes first? What comes first? Do you obey him and then you fall in love as you're obeying? Yes. Or do you fall in love with him and then out of a place like that, the natural thing that you do is just obey what he says. Which is it? It's both. When you're in love with Jesus... Obeying is not hard. Obeying is not difficult. You don't need anybody to motivate you to obey his commands. You need to fall in love with Jesus. In fact, if somebody has tried to tell you that you need to obey his commands, it's probably proof that you don't love Jesus. (laughs) Because nobody ought to need to tell you that. Okay? You need tonight to fall in love with him. You need tonight to return to that first purity, that first work of God that he did in your life. It's time to cast spiritual entropy away. Deal with this. Examine our hearts. The last scripture of tonight is Revelation 2, verse 1. 
I know you probably all saw this coming. Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, by the way, read the book of Ephesians and look how many times Paul writes to them about the love of God, about love, about love, about love, love, love. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Whew. Verse 2. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Verse 3. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. But verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You see... Verses 1 through 3 is easily us. Let's read those again. Verses 1. This is a church that has the golden lampstand here. When people used to come into the church while it was still a garage, every, Matthew, Pastor Matt was telling me, everyone said, man, the presence of God is here. I could feel the presence of God. When people come to this church, it's the first thing they feel is the presence of God. Verse 2. I know your deeds and your hard work. Man, we're a church that works hard. We're a church that has deeds. We're a church that perseveres. We're a church that cannot tolerate wicked people. We test those who claim to be apostles. And we have found some to be false, haven't we, church? Verse 3. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name. You're going to hear on Sunday how we have persevered and endured hardships and have not grown weary. You're going to hear that. That is us. And we're not going to stop doing that. We're not going to stop that for one second because we don't tolerate those things. And yet, we can look at the fruit we can look at our fruit and count it as our first love are you hearing what I'm saying we can look at the fact that we don't tolerate wicked men that we test people and find them false and that we endure hardships and count that as our first love it's not our first love those things result from our first love okay Many have said that the lampstand of God is in this church. And that lampstand is not here because we endure and persevere. That lampstand is here because we love him more than anything else. Our hearts are burning for him. Our hearts are desiring him. Our hearts want him more than anything else. Our hearts want to know him better. That is why the lampstand of God is here. So verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. The things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Church, what are the things that you used to do at first? You know what it is for me? There was a time in my life where I used to pray every night, not because I wanted anything, because I wanted to connect with my father. There was a time in my walk where every morning I used to get up and worship him, not because anybody was around, not because I cared who watched, it's because I loved him. I loved him. And I loved to be with him. I did that every day. And I gotta admit to you that those things have kind of waned and been far further and fewer in between. It's because I've let spiritual in, in, entropy creep in. I've let those thorns like busyness and comfortability come and steal that from me and steal that from Jesus. He, he deserves it from me. So tonight, I want you to stand. As we get into worship, I want you to consider the things that you did at first. 
I want you to consider the results of your relationship with God. Test yourselves to see if you are doing the things that you did at first. Test yourselves and see if you're walking in the results that God originally put into your life. Amen? Mighty God, Lord, we ask that you would move in us. Lord, that you would move in our hearts. Lord, that you would cause us to cry out. Lord, not for anything else but you and you alone. Lord, that you would cause us to yearn for your presence, yearn for your fellowship, yearn for your words. Lord, as if we are like a soul thirsty. Lord, as the deer pants for the water, so our souls thirst for you tonight. Lord, we cry out that you would water our thirsty souls. In Jesus' name we pray.